Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Shett, episode 518, featuring an interview with the great DJ Slope of Slope's Game Room. Fabulous, fabulous retro gaming uh, uh, YouTube channel. Uh, I mean, uh, Slope does some of the best uh, work I've ever seen. Uh, deep dives in a series he calls uh, the Complete History videos, everything from Castlevania to Boulder Dash. Uh, God, what all's up there? <laughs> uh, many, many to, to choose from. Uh, and when he says deep dives, he's not playing around. I mean, the man has great video editing chops, but he's just as diligent with the research. I think you'll really be impressed if you watch those. Uh, he's also got a series called Kick Scammers, where he talks of it's sort of an investigative, uh, investigative journalism-like approach to Kickstarters uh, that didn't deliver, or in some cases actually were engaging in corrupt, if not outright criminal, behavior. And all of these, uh, you know, sometimes very serious topics, but nonetheless, a very entertaining, very addictive uh, video series. Plus, he's done tons of other things. He's just a, a really fun dude, and I know you're going to enjoy uh, getting to uh, meet him. Uh, so we've got a lot to cover here. So without further ado, here's DJ Slope. So, DJ Slope. <laughs> yes. How's it going? How's it going? All good here, my friend. All good here. Like I say, apologies for running in a little bit late there. I'm going to try and stop playing with Rubik's Cubes while I talk to you. I'll put that down. Time is uh, time. <laughs> uh, my end, it's 4.27. Oh, well, it's only 10.30 here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 10.30 p.m. I never have gotten used to these, this this concept that we live on a globe, right? I mean, Sorry about it, man. 24 hours of time zones. I mean, it's, it's too much for me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's all good. It's all good. I'm, like I said, I've been working on a um, uh, a Blu-ray recently, and the guy uh, who's working on that with me is in Rhode Island. So it's just been stupidly late nights for both of us. Uh, me staying up till like early hours in the morning to like go on with his time and vice versa. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, at least we don't have to travel. <laughs> Take, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty awesome. <clears throat> pretty awesome. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Oh, so yeah, I've been having a great time looking at your videos, man. I mean, I think your production values are probably the best I've seen. Oh wow, thank you. I, 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 that, that's incredible to hear that. I mean, I saw um, looked on your thing, and you got people like Clint from Lazy Game Reviews and stuff like that. Oh, uh, very good ones for me. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So that's. Uh, but I mean, I just the, <laughs> you know you got so many things going on in these videos, and I've done a little. I've, I've done enough of that work to appreciate how yeah. long it can take to find like b-roll footage and work it all in and do the fun transitions and all that editing i mean wow, takes a long time incredible thank you thank you are, are, pretty... we, are we recording are we recording for this now is this is this the yeah, thing it's or we, are we started no, it's not live but it's, uh... oh right, okay <laughs> that's no, that's cool. but I, I appreciate it thank you and you must have a pretty large crew i'm guessing uh it is entirely me it's all me. You're kidding me. No, it's all me. I've out of the. I don't even know how many videos are on my I channel. Like five hundred videos. Data. Yeah, out of those five hundred videos, I've had. You like, sleep? <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, not th not this last week. Not so much. It's got to be said. But um, no, I mean, like out of like those five hundred odd videos, maybe ten, fifteen, I've had help with editing, um, and a few extra helping with the scripts um but like 95 if not 99 percent is yeah all me that's all me wow i am in truly impressed oh well, thank you very much uh <laughs> what, a work, what a work ethic i mean yeah i mean even like these little title screens i mean i <laughs> oh, i do know, spend a long time on the phone it now. takes time to do all this and yeah yeah it does it does i've got a template for some of it but like you know like for instance you'll see that the kickstarter's logo is genuinely in the same place roughly um mm -hmm. little things like that uh but yeah i mean yeah they take a long time uh, i'm actually in the process of updating the majority of my um uh, uh thumbnails at the moment uh mm -hmm. and doing ones like uh there's none on the screen oh no you got one there the indiegogo's Dis uh, titanic disaster uh, and then one on the far right, Night Trap, they messed up everything. They're, 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 they look very simple. but uh, And then you obviously got the almost uh, millions, stole millions on Kickstarter. Uh, yeah, trying to uh, uh, get those to work in that way and, and look simple 
it actually sometimes takes even longer. I've just seen that I've got a video on one of my playlists that isn't mine, uh, Spawn Wave. I need to remove that. I was watching that video a couple of months ago when I was cleaning a controller um, and obviously accidentally put it in one of my playlists. <laughs> it's like a little, I saw some uh, Dragon's Lair. Bit of Dragon's Lair there, yeah, talking about Night Trap. Well, Night, Night Trap. Trap's essentially. There's a connection between Night Trap and Dragon's Lair. I need to watch this. Oh, thank you. Well, no, it's more the fact that, like, Night Trap is very much just a, a game made up of movie clips that you have to oh, keep sure. attaching, yeah, and yeah. that's kind of what Night Trap is. So it was just like comparing, like, the giving a brief history on those sort of FMV games, really. That's all it was. I, mean, I dare somebody to look at your channel and not click on a couple of these videos. Right. This is a question about, uh, you know, well, I, I realize that. You know, the production value is being high. I know that takes time, but I'm guessing you probably put as much time, if not more, into the research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, you know. Component of this. I mean, these are you got like the these complete histories where you're going and I saw one about uh, Castlevania. Yeah, that took a long time. I mean, my God, you've got like this is an interview that's in this Japanese magazine that's you know only <laughs> appeared one time. <laughs> Like, oh yeah, for God. sure. I mean, tracking that kind of stuff down. Yeah, I mean, I've got go to. I've got like several places that I go to um, that are like my my first. So if if I'll show you how I how I how I create like a Castlevania complete history, for instance. Okay. Um, so for instance, that one. First things first. Run to any kind of website, even Wikipedia, and just find out how many games there are, and I get my list of games, and there they are. Um, as I work through, nine times out of ten, you're going to discover, especially with Castlevania, there's a lot more games um, than what somewhere simple like Wikipedia will 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 tell you. Like especially the original, the early ones that I was discovering, there were like home computer versions that hardly anyone had ever spoken about. You know, stuff like this. So the first thing you got to do is find out a big list of all of the games that are going to be talked about. Then I have my set go-to resources of different places, whether that be uh, Retro Game Magazine. I've got a stupid amount of those up on my shelf. Um, you know, Hardcore 101. Uh, there's Schmuplations, which is a great website for um, uh, translating interviews from, uh, from, from, from Japan, from Japanese magazines and articles mm -hmm. and all these different areas. And I try and fill in as many gaps as I can on that timeline of okay they talk about this game in this they talk about that game in here blah 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 um and then you know if castlevania is harder because it's all in J japan the majority of its development uh, uh has been in japan but if it's more of a uk based one or an american based one i can reach out to the people myself uh and and that is so much easier than what people expect it to be um i mean you, you'll either just get an instant yes or an instant no it's just a you know, like you don't always get it, but thankfully, with more recent games, tens, if not hundreds, of people work on these games. So you're going to be normally be able to speak to someone. You know, um, uh, going to a website like Moby Games, you can normally find the credits quite easily with that. Go searching for that, and when you do that a lot, eventually, if you can't get hold of someone, you know someone that can get hold of that person for you, um, because you've you, you know you've built up the rapport with someone from a previous complete history and yeah all the bits just all fall, start falling into place and that that's how a video like that comes about and then you just got to fill in the gaps with, with with text and before you know it you've got a 30 40 page script and <laughs> go out to the game room start filming it and yeah that's it you make it sound easy <laughs> uh, it's definitely not um it's definitely not you know okay, castlevania yeah. took several months to make that video now, all these complete histories, they say you even have ones for Turrican. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boulder Dash, that must have taken some time. Yeah, absolutely. That one was actually a really cool one. I got um I got asked to make that video. Um, that was really, really cool because the majority of home computer games don't tend to do well on the channel. I'm always gonna make what I want to make, but now I do this full time. Mm. You've got to be a bit more careful in the sense of like um, okay, so this video, I know when I release this video, it's probably not going to do too well because it's a very unknown, uh, a very not very well known franchise. If I did like Resident we... Evil, it's going to be one great. We... Which one are we talking about? A Boulder Dash or, or... Oh, Boulder Dash? Yeah, something like oh, that. So that's not a very well. See, this is I don't even know which ones are not very well known because I, I love Boulder Dash. I, I get thrown off guard <laughs> sometimes. You know, I was, I was expecting like 
Dino Crisis or Super Mario Brothers to do really well, and they actually did worse than Boulder Dash. So it doesn't always work out that way. But when yeah. you do them, you've got to try and uh, uh, put them in the middle of two videos that you know will do well. So it will help lift up the one that you are going in that's not not as well known. You know. Yeah, that's that's good to hear somebody else that has that that question because I've had that same issue sometimes where mm. it's some I post something and I think this is really obscure. It's not going to go anywhere. Yeah. Uh, then it ends up getting, you know, tons. And I think my most popular video is like Might and Magic 6. Right. Okay. Uh, which is a great game. But yeah, yeah. You know, I'm not surprised that, you know, that one would be doing so much better than all the uh, other ones. But, you know, like uh, some people were asking me, why don't you cover Baldur's Gate 3? Me or? No, they, they were asking me this. Oh, I was about to say, yeah, not me. Mostly <laughs> yeah, maybe you should. You probably have a video. You have a video? I, on that? I haven't got anything on Baldur's Gate 3. No, I, I, I very sadly have never played it ever. I, my thought is, you know, it would just be one video in amongst, you know, hundreds of videos covering that. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So you got to kind of counterbalance that with something that might rank a little higher because there's not so many videos in the, in the algorithm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I did um, one uh, on uh, the history of Dizzy, uh, for instance. Um, oh, that did sure. very well. Um, and I wasn't expecting that to do big numbers because, you know, and it's, that's a very obscure UK mascot. Um, but that was the first, that was my first love in gaming, really, <laughs> the Dizzy franchise. So, uh, yeah, I, I ended up doing that. And over time, that's built up quite nicely. Oh, there we go. 110,000. That's not too bad. Yeah, I've heard of this. I don't know if Dizzy. Yeah, so it, it, he's they're, they're they're kind of like adventure puzzle games. Uh, very very slow moving. Let scroll left and right. You know, you got to pick up an item, then you take it to someone else that will give you another item to go back to someone else, and you know, progress the story. But they're very um, they they were quite a big deal here in the nineties. Uh, no, sorry, in the eighties uh, here in the UK. Oh yeah, this looks like what is that? The uh, ZX. Uh, that would be the ZX Spectrum version, yes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So in the UK, uh, in the 80s, I had a uh, Amstrad CPC 464. Um, and Dizzy was kind of like the mascot for that. Uh, not not just that, but that, you know, as a young kid, it was a very desirable uh, mascot. You know, um, I didn't really know much about Sonic the Hedgehog. In fact, I don't think Sonic the Hedgehog was a thing when I knew about, you know, uh, Dizzy. I'd heard rumblings of this Mario character, but I'd never really played one of his games. So this this is what I grew up on, playing games like this. That's fascinating to think about how different the oh, UK experience. So different. I mean, look at this, folks. I mean, like every few seconds there's a clip, there's you know, pop-ups, there's animation. I mean, my this is high, this is higher production values than <laughs> I remember that uh, what was that G4 network? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember G4, yeah. I mean, yeah. You're just kicking their butt. Oh well, thank you very much. Maybe I need to get you like promoting the channel or something. That'd be cool. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, another review from Matt Barton. Yeah, <laughs> sounds good to me. You know, I, I'm just I've done enough of this where I, I realize, you know, good work when I see it. Oh, thank you. you. Know, there's, there's so many YouTubers that just kind of throw stuff together and you know for whatever reason get <laughs> incredible uh, views. You know, that always bothers it, it me. It happens. It happens. You know, like it's a luck factor. It's it's one of those things. I, I'm I'm very I, I would say lucky, but this has kind of been my aim since the beginning. I've always tried to make the absolute best content I can on a particular subject. So, uh, you know, if I'm going to be talking about Streets of Rage or Castlevania or anything, um, I'm going to make that video the absolute best I possibly can to the point where this is the ultimate video about that one particular franchise. Um, and when I do that, you know, out of the gate they end up becoming these hugely big projects. Uh, like Castlevania is like a two-hour video. I think Pac-Man's two hours when you put that together as well, uh, my video on that. But over time, uh, people continue to watch those videos. They're called evergreen videos. So yeah. when I, um, if, if I was to, to review the latest Call of Duty game, for instance, it would be popular for a week, that video, and then it would never be looked at again. Uh, where if I look at my analytics, um, which obviously I often do, you know, those older videos based on Contra or whatever the, the subject is still get views every single uh, month. Um, and that's how I've been able to, to to basically keep afloat, basically just having a big backlog of a backlog of evergreen videos. Now, so you're somebody who really knows like how to work these analytics. 
<laughs> well, I, I don't know. I, 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 for me, but like I, I watched <laughs> one of your videos and you were saying that uh, it really makes a big difference if people like a video or subscribe or, or comment on a video. Yeah, it does. You've actually studied the analytics, you know. So, so what what is the relationship there? Is it, why is it? Why does it make such a big difference? So it changes all the time. I'm going to tell you this now, but this is something that I uh, learned a year or so ago. And honestly, like it might have changed since then. So what I might be telling you is old news or by the time that someone listens to this half a year down the line, it will be old news. But the general idea of what you're supposed to do uh, with uh, uh, a video is one, obviously get your, your likes, get your comments um, uh, and, and sharing obviously always helps. Um, but when you release a video, the promotion for that video needs to be going out instantly. So you basically have a two hour window. No one knows if that's the exact figure, exact number, exact amount of time, but that's what's believed to be the case. You've got two hours for, to get as many eyeballs on that video as humanly possible, depending on how well you do in that first two hours. Um, uh, it, it's it's going, YouTube are going to promote it that amount. So in the first two hours, if you only get like 10 people watching it, they go, oh, no one likes this video. Let's not bother doing it. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's not bother promoting it as much. So you've basically got two two attempts. You've got the first two hours and then the first, I think it's either one day or two days. So basically, when I promote, when I release a video, I already have three or four tabs open for my Twitter, my Facebook, my Instagram, um, all the, you know, Discord, places like that. So as soon as I press go, next tab, go, next tab, go, next tab, go, and it's all ready to go. And then I've got, Hopefully, as many people can see that within the first 120 minutes as possible. You don't mind. I'm going to take some notes here. I mean, that, that it's that's just what I do. Yeah, two hour <laughs> I always done it that way, and it seems to be okay sometimes, not always, but you know, it's what it is. Well, it makes perfect sense. I'm going to. I think I've been doing some stuff wrong. <laughs> and I mean, that's why I release my videos uh, late on a Saturday because late on a Saturday is kind of the best time um but that's your American time in the uk yeah yeah late on a saturday oh, for that... me because that means it would be earlier in the day for you so i need a saturday morning like the cartoons is going to be the best time but i mean yeah and then obviously the the, the english still have or my side of the, the the pond also have a half a decent time as well um but if i release a video early in the morning in uk time on a wednesday that means it's going up live in america in the middle of the night tuesday is that right yeah middle of the night tuesday uh <laughs> and while everyone's at work here on wednesday it, it's yeah it's not going to work so do you have more uk viewers than american no viewers? no not at all i'm i'm very american centric uh a lot more people watch my stuff in america um i, I think it's just because it's bigger landmass right honestly there, there's just there's more of america than you could fit england in one of your states you know <laughs> So there it is, you know. And then of course you've got your Patreon channel looks good. Yeah, yeah, Patreon's doing fine. So you used to let you join for free. you uh, let people join for free. Yeah, I need to find out what's going on here. I keep getting messages that say join for free. Like, what does join for free do? I think what it is is I offer a trial. Um, and if it, I, you know what, I'm watching you. Would you be able to join for free? Not the seven day trial. I want to see what happens when people join for free. <laughs> Because this is new information to me. I the first know. one's free. Welcome. Well, as a free member, you'll get updates on public posts. Okay, right. Break, oh, sorry to break it to you. I don't release public posts. Uh, so I need to remove that free option because there's just nothing that's going to be good for anyone <laughs> in the free well, option. I don't, get, I don't get anything for free. I saw it go. Hey, what do but I have to do? There is a um, seven-day free trial I do, which basically gives people access to everything I've ever released. Um uh without sponsorships without adverts all that sort of stuff i've got an absurd amount of uh exclusive to do videos. To get a hat? i want a hat you want a hat i'm actually to... um signing up with a company as we speak i was only messaging them uh earlier today yesterday all, all the days are merging together now but either way yeah i've got a slopes gaming hats coming yeah that looks good i like the hat cheers <laughs> cheers it's definitely not to cover up anything that's uh you know showing my age no. you know? <laughs> Yeah, right, tons of stuff we could talk about here. I, I was gonna 
ask you about something I've seen in the news today. I was kind of curious. As, you know, as somebody that's got so much experience with all these, I'm sure you have a lot to, to say about it. Bring some context to this. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Uh, this uh, Vision Pro thing. Right, the Apple Vision Pro. I saw pictures of this earlier, um, but I haven't looked into this in any way whatsoever. This is augmented reality, I'm guessing? Yeah, it seems like there's, it's one of those, it's like the latest effort to do something like this. I mean, there's, I yeah. remember uh, Google had something and then Facebook's got something, some Ray-Ban mm. glasses. You know, so I'm always getting asked about these things and like, is this a, is this a fad? Is this going to take off? Is this significantly better than all the stuff that's come before? Yeah. Is it a gimmick? Is it, you know, is it, I take it you're not too excited about it. No, no, no don't get me wrong. Right. I've got, <clears throat> you can see behind me, I've got my PlayStation 5. Right. Um, I've got, Underneath the desk next to me, I've got the PlayStation VR, the first revision of it for the that came out for the PlayStation 4 uh, era. Uh, and I've got uh, an Oculus as well. Um, those three systems just do not get played. Um, I mean, I, I got some vouchers for Christmas because um, I just buy every game I want to get nowadays. So people don't tend to buy me games anymore. <laughs> They're just like, here's some vouchers, go choose the game you want. Um, and I'm like, you know what? I've got to buy a PlayStation 5 game because I'm just not playing on that thing. Um, mm. I, I have so little time as a dad and, you know, doing this as my job, you know, always, always uh, uh, editing or, or if I am playing a game, normally it's I'm playing a game because not because I want to necessarily, not because it's a game I would normally choose. It's because it's a bad game in a big franchise but I've never played that game because it's the bad one in the franchise and I need to know how it plays, you know? <laughs> um, so it is what it is. I've got, uh, it's not next to me, it's behind me. I was, I was playing uh, Bionic Commander for the Xbox 360 recently just because that's a video I might make soon, you know? Um, and yeah, th 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 this 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 VR thing you're, you're looking at, I'm sure it's fantastic. I'd love to have one, but I also know I'm just going to give it so little time. <laughs> I'm just not going to play on it. Yeah, I noticed this. Not, a lot of these devices, you know, unless they've got a killer app, you know, or some some and really great product issue. for it. I mean, then then you'll go out and buy it. But just the hardware alone, it doesn't yeah. matter how impressive it looks. Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I was so impressed with my PlayStation Four that had a lot of good exclusives, and I really enjoyed the the amount of games I got out of that. Heck, even the Wii U had a good amount of exclusives for that short lifespan it had. But I don't. I, I own normally every console that comes out, but I haven't bought myself the Xbox Series X because I look at it and I'm like, "There's nothing on this console." Not that's of interest to me, but there's just. I mean, I'm not a big Forza fan, so take that out of the equation or Halo. And then what you're left with is like, there's no games here. There's absolutely no games here. PlayStation Five isn't far behind. It's got to be said, but it's all about those exclusives. It absolutely mm -hmm. is. It, it, you're kind of more of a retro gamer anyway so maybe this is maybe you know, some of your videos you look for like the <laughs> amico here <laughs> like, oh yeah 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 the amico, know, yeah. Like, the retro... <laughs> uh, well it's such a great video i mean <laughs> no 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 it's fine uh, yeah that video <laughs> that video did well for me um and uh that was that was a painful video to make that took a long long time to make that video i started that video I, I, it's, it's all merging now. It's around the beginning of October, I think. I, I, I it's around there. I can't remember exactly. It was about Octoberish time, uh, and well, I was eleven months ago. I says, yeah, yeah, but I released it in February. It took that oh. long from when I started it to um oh, four hours. You should have put like ten more, nine more seconds. <laughs> I know, I know. I could have done, couldn't I? Um, yeah, I could have done nine more seconds. Uh, and it's funny as well, because when everyone says, oh, you got that three-hour video on the Amico. You got that three-hour video on the Amico. I'm like, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's four hours, let's be honest. <laughs> you know? Uh, but no, that took a long time to make that video. Um, oh God, yeah. the detail in this. I mean, when you say deep dive, you're not kidding. Yeah, this was hardcore. This was hardcore. I often get asked if I'm going to make a director's cut of it as well, which would make it five hours potentially i don't know because it's it's a still ongoing saga and in as insane as it sounds there was genuinely stuff i missed out uh and, and chose not to put in there in, in some instances as well um because you've got to keep that flow going you know what i mean i look at my videos like 
Tom and Jerry cartoons. You're never watching a Tom and Jerry cartoon and you're, you're never bored. You know, there's always something happening on the screen. And that's kind of how I make my videos <laughs> for better and for worse. It's probably what makes them kind of addictive too, you know. The... Yeah. Always looking. I think with my videos, people tend to just, you know, they're working on something else and they have it on the background because it's mostly yeah. audio. People do uh, that with mine. I, I get that message quite often. People do that. And I mean, that, that's that's nice. Well, they're missing out on all the stuff if they do that. I mean. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, I do feel stuff that. The yeah. look at is to listen to in, in your videos. No, oh, I appreciate you. You're being very, very kind. <laughs> what, is, what about this, Amico? I guess we should talk about it a little bit. Yeah, I'm happy to. Yeah. I mean, what drew you? Why did you want to cover that? And what was the... Well, um, so I, I mean, cover, it's obviously a fascinating story. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's there's your number one thing. It is fascinating. It's um, th th oh, there's so many reasons. So basically, I obviously I do the kick scammer series. So I look at uh, failed um, kickstarters, and I get extra excited when those fail. No, this wasn't a Kickstarter, but it was still crowdfunded. Uh, I get extra excited when those uh, projects are related to gaming because obviously that that uh, that pleases all of my audience. Um, you know, gaming and 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 Kickstarter scams. So that's everyone's happy there, um, and uh, yeah, it's also a retro gaming dev uh, company that have come back to make a new system. So it's it's all of that, all of that, and the above. Uh, but on top of that, um, I I've gone on record and said it before, and I don't mind saying it again. Uh, I, I, Tommy Tallarico was a bit of a hero of mine uh, as mm. a kid. I I I was like, this guy's cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? I I'm not ashamed to say I think I'm pretty sure I knew his name before I knew who Shigeru Miyamoto was and who Yu Suzuki was and you know all of the other people because he was the person that was featured in in magazines um and the games that I knew that he that I discovered that he worked on even as a youngster before the days of the internet before you know about all this sort of stuff he was working on things like Global Gladiators and I remember putting that in my Mega Drive I'm like this is a wicked soundtrack this is awesome and I really had a lot of fun playing the more the bonus stage on that rather than the main game, but still, yeah, that uh, he worked on Earthworm Jim, and I'm still one of my favorite platformers of all time. Uh, Earthworm Jim one, and there's several others as well. MDK. Um, mm. So as the years went on, I was like, wow, that, that guy's cool. I really, really like like Shiny Entertainment, the whole Dave Perry and and Tommy Tallarico thing. It, it, it's it's fully a case of don't meet your heroes because when I did meet him super nice chap to me he was so so nice but coming from a sales background myself um i should have spotted that and i'm sure he'll convince himself that he didn't do this but it definitely was the case that he was very much using my channel as a way to promote his product uh and which is fine a lot of companies do that but it's not fine when they're lying to you and your audience so they're essentially getting you to lie for them oh, um to sell that product this was personal then it, it, it got personal yeah personal. so i remember i said to him i ended up having this this interview with him and it was a stupidly long interview i think maybe four or five hours or something like that i can't remember it was a really long time and i decided look, what we're going to do because he was getting a lot of back uh backlash from the haters as they were called oh they are still called um uh, and I said, well, look, what I'm going to do, Tommy, is I will do, let's do a history of you first. Let's talk about your history in gaming. We'll make the whole first half that. So it was like maybe an hour and a half or something to that effect. Uh, and then we did another one where it was just him talking about the Amico. And I was very, very soft, low ball -y with him. Um, I mean, I, I still stand by there were certain questions that I couldn't answer because I. it's one of those things retrospectively I could have answered better, but I didn't know the information I knew that I know now back then. Um, and uh, yeah, that really put me in the firing line uh, with a lot of people. And it, and it very quickly, not, not actually that's the wrong, it, it slowly, but surely started to open my eyes as to what was actually going on here. Um, and the more I looked into this, the more it was like, wow, this is bad actually. Okay. And I always said one day I'm going to do that video. And I said to him in that interview, look, Tommy, if this turns out to be a scam, I'll do a video on it. If it turns out to be great, I'll do a video on it. You know, and that was essentially it. And, he's, and he was like, tear me apart. You know, I'm like, I will. Let's do it. Wow. And um, <laughs> eventually I did. Um, and 
Uh, yeah, people always ask me, so I'll answer it before you do. Uh, I've not spoken to him since. <laughs> but we are still friends, apparently, on Facebook. Um, yeah. There we yeah, go. I've often thought about that. I've, I have a lot of, had a lot of high profile guests mm. on my show. Yeah, a, lot, a lot of my heroes. And sometimes I'll be doing, I remember I had some folks doing those sort of NFT projects and, mm. you, know, you know, things along those lines. And I'm always kind of walking that line between, you know, obviously if I, if I do the true investigative journalism, you know, type, type approach, <laughs> start asking the tough questions, you yeah. know, it's not like, it's not like they're obligated in any way. Uh, to stick around, you know, my, my fear is they would just, the word we get around, Hey, don't go on, you know, don't, don't go to uh, Matt Barton's channel or don't, don't, uh, <laughs> don't do an interview with him, you know, cause he'll try to make us look bad or something like that. So I know, I know what you mean. That's uh, always in the back of my mind, but on the other hand, I don't want to misrepresent or allow somebody to. Yeah. Know, so mm -hmm. like the, the, another, a good example of that is I also interviewed uh, Doug to Naple. Uh, who is the creator of um, and the designer and the, the maker of uh, Earthworm Jim. He's the guy that came up with the concept. So again, as a kid, he was a bit of a hero of mine because you'd see his picture in the magazines, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I was like, oh, that, that's, that's a cool guy. However, when you start to learn a bit more about his personal beliefs and all of that sort of stuff and, and the way he, he is uh, um, against certain communities and all that sort of stuff, um, they... They 100% fully do not align with the way I think. Um, so the way I go about these sort of things is I got to look, unless it's obviously horrendous. Like John Kay is one of my, was one of yeah. my heroes as well as a kid. Oh, so, I, but yeah, that, that, that's too far. That's too that far. That was so disturbing. That, that that's terrible. too far. I don't know but, any of that until I watched your video, by the way. Oh yeah. Yeah. That That's too far. But with, with someone like Doug to Naple, I, I'm in here because I'm talking about the history of retro gaming. If it gets onto that subject, I'll very bluntly say, look, I'm sorry, we don't share our views here. And I'll quickly try and move it back to re uh, retro gaming because that's why you're here. I'm not right. here to talk about your politics or anything like that. I'm just here to talk about retro gaming. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but um, yeah, that, that, that's, that's my view on it. Yeah. I think if, if we, if I think if we cancel people because of different view types, it, 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 it pushes those view types to be even stronger. Um, and then you, you're just building up bigger and bigger walls against each other. Um, well, I feel like open conversation's good. Um, I, I, I I didn't want him to bring up anything. I, I'm really going off on one here. I really didn't want him to bring up anything uh, that I didn't, uh, you know, that, that were against. Whatever, you get what I'm saying. I'm, I'm going off on one here. <laughs> I get, you know, if they've got something to say, you know. I don't yeah, feel it, like, it went down people realize you know, if I have a guest on and the guest is giving certain views, that doesn't mean that I have those views. That, that and that's the prop. That's the thing. I do not share. Yeah, you, you always see those disclaimers that, that do not represent the company or whatever. You know. Um, oh but, yeah, these are so and so's personal opinions. Only. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> you say you have a background in sales, huh? Uh, well, kind of like. A little bit, not too much. I, I worked at like selling PC parts to other companies and stuff like that. It wasn't, it wasn't an exciting job, really. Yeah, I did have some questions from people about where you picked up your uh, video editing shops. Um, so that, um, as a teenager, I got really into making mixtapes because uh, I was a DJ a lot more then than I am now. Um, did the DJ circuit, like club circuit, festival circuit, that sort of thing. Uh, so I did a lot of mixtapes and the company that make the audio mixing uh, software, Acid Pro, um, they also make uh, Vegas. It was Sony back then and now it's Magix. And once you learn one, the other one comes very quick. And I was DJing at Download Festival one year um, and the place was going off. It was amazing. Like one of the best crowds I've ever had in my life. Thousands of people. Um, and I was on the mic, like, make sure you go on Facebook and look up DJ Slope or whatever. And I was getting cheers and everyone's going insane. Wow. And I went back and I got like five people at me out of thousands <laughs> and thousands. So what I discovered was what I'm going to do is I'm going to get into video DJing where I start having like a big projector up there. Uh, and then people will be there with their phones. You know, if I have cool imagery going on from games and from movies and like whilst like, you know, the music's playing all that sort of stuff. And in that way, people will remember my name and go and search for me. So I then had to get very, I had to learn how to very quickly 
do video editing on um, on top of music because it would it's essentially just like mixing normal normal music, but there's a video attached to it as well. It's like MP4s instead of MP3s, um, and uh, yeah, that that's how I learned how to video edit absurdly quickly, uh, but also make it look really flashy and exciting, you know. Well, so there's the lesson: just become a DJ first. <laughs> And then you'll pick yeah. up the video editing shows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I would love to go. Do you still do your uh, DJ shows? Or? Uh, it's been a while. It's been a little while. It's, you know, I mean, I've got kids now. I'm older. Um, back in the day, I'd DJ every weekend and then every... Uh, uh, on the lead up to my wedding, I think I was for like two years, I DJed every Tuesday night until about three or four in the morning. Um, and then I would go home, get up at seven, and... Um, go to work and then go to sleep in a in a um in a supermarket car park for half an hour just to try and get a power nap and i did that for like two years uh, i'm gonna hit me anymore man <laughs> how old are your kids uh i've got a uh a, an eight-year-old and a six-year-old oh good ages for gaming then yeah yeah definitely definitely they like dads are gaming or are they more like they are into gaming i remember <laughs> Everyone always used to ask, like, what games are you going to get your kids into and all that sort of yeah. stuff? And I'm like, you can't be like that. You've got to let your kids be into the games of their generation. You know, like my son plays Minecraft and Fortnite and my daughter likes Mario Kart and um, well, obviously the latest Mario Kart, Mario Kart, Animal Crossing and, and Minecraft too. But on top of that, my son can probably beat me at Pac-Man. Like, you know, so I've got a lot of classic games and they they know about them they know what all of the the iconic arcade games of dig dug are and all that and he's really good at these sort of games so as long as you don't force it on them and you let them have a play when they see it and they're interested i think that that's the way to go um yeah he's uh just got into turtles recently so he's playing the side scroll and beat him up turtles so i'm coming in like do you, do you want to try some streets of rage that's you know <laughs> like so just teasing him in there little bit by bit yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Bad. I was just thinking back. I played a lot of games with my dad. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you had that experience. My my family, even my mother would play a lot of video games. Mm -hmm. My um mum was big on puzzle type games. Uh, actually, no, I remember she was really into like Sonic when I first got that. Uh, and we had a Galaxian ripoff on the Amstrad that she got really into. Oh my god! Still, I still play Galaxian loads i've actually got a mini arcade of it out in the uh, game room um um and uh but then i think when she discovered columns on the mega drive it was like that that's her game now you know 100 <laughs> percent, that is her game and and technically i suppose she still plays that game you know with handy crush or whatever uh One to mile. this day which isn't a million miles away is it let's be honest um but yeah, no, with my uh, stepdad at the time, yeah, you know, play a bit of Streets of Rage or Mortal Kombat, you know, stuff like that. Wow. Yeah, trying to get him to let me have the uh, the blood cheat on the Mega Drive <laughs> version. Or the Genesis version. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. yeah, my mom, for whatever reason, got sucked into Gorf. If you remember that one, Gorf. What, the um, uh, oh, adventure team. game? Yeah, we had that on, I think, the VIC-20 or the Commodore 64. I've talked about Gorf, I think. She was hilarious. I mean, she was really a. Uh, uh, she would do a lot of trash talking and yelling. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, oh, uh, is it more of um? Oh, it's more of a Space Invaders. I'm thinking of a different game. Okay, I haven't it's talked. A, about it's like a couple of different games built into one. <clears throat> oh, actually, one of the sprites literally looks exactly like a Space Invader, and another one looks like one from Gallagher. Okay. <laughs> I have to look this up. Medley. It's kind of a gaming medley, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. I, I recognize the logo because obviously it's always coming up. Um, it's one of those things like, no, I've not played this, but I know it's on my hard drive. I'll have to play it. <laughs> That's the world we live in. Well, so you've done a lot of videos about Kickstarter. Yeah. A lot yeah. of uh, focus on the scams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, as I... When I was telling people I was going to interview you. They're like, "Oh yeah, I got caught up in that one, and I you know, got caught up in that." One. You know, so I was wondering you'd probably be the, a really good person to ask this. You know, so if if there's some new Kickstarter that comes out, mm. it looks good. You know, it catches your catches your eye. What should you look for? They're like telltale signs that hmm, I mean, there, there's don't want to maybe go for this one. I mean, I mean the the, the thing to think about straight away is. um 
you're not buying something. You're um even though technically Kickstarter should be more to the point where they've got the phys- they've got a working prototype or product before they go to the platform. <clears throat> Indiegogo, you can go there with just an idea and go, this is my idea. Give me some money, I'll make it happen. Where Kickstarter, they should, it doesn't always it doesn't always play out like this, but they should have a product at least working and go, look, here it is. This is what I want to make. So you you t- Kickstarter should be the safer bet um over indiegogo so there's that um uh, things you could look out for though is you the, the first thing you always do i do this with every single person i i, I uh, every single campaign i back um you click on their name and you can see all of the other projects that they've created uh and if it's like a board game company for instance i do a lot of board game um kickstarters nine times out of ten it won't be their first one um and you click on their other ones, and you're like, wow, okay, they've done another 10 campaigns. Let's just have a quick look at them. Uh, and if you look in the comments, you can see, I've got the game. That was incredible. Got the game. That was incredible. You know, all that. I'm like, this is a decent company. I'm willing to put my money in. Um, but if you start seeing, still not received it, still not received it. When's the game? Why have you not given us updates? That's obviously a telltale sign. Um I also think um, you, you start to get an idea on on money. Uh, you know, if if someone wants either too high an amount of money or too low an amount of money, more so on the low side, they don't know what they're doing. They just think this is a cool idea. I can do this. Um, they might have great, they might have good intentions, and most of the time, I think they do, but they definitely haven't done the research to. Um, actually get this thing made especially if it's a physical product if it's a digital game it's not as bad um and that's a lot harder to tell because you know you don't know how long uh, far along someone is in creating a a game that's going to be released digitally but if it's a physical product like a board game and they're only asking for like ten thousand or something like that you're like this is going to be pretty hard when it goes into production you know like that sort of thing and and nine times out of ten it is so i mean they're they're the two big ones i would look at um if you're going in Board games are my always my go-to. So if you're looking at a board game, um, this looks incredible. Look at what they've done in the past. Look at what the comment section on that particular one is saying. Because normally, if there's a scam behind it, people run people put down a pound or a dollar um, uh, to, to to run to the comments and shout them out. Do not back this project. You know, just oh. for the sake of doing that. Um, and then also have a look at how much they're charging. And if you're not too sure, just look up other ones that are of a similar nature. And if you see, like, uh, you know, Kickstarter B, C, D, E, F, and G are all charging 10,000, but this one's only charging 1,000, you're like, okay, this is a bit weird. What's mm. going on? Um, so, yeah, there, I mean, there's some obvious signs straight up. So, what is the ratio you think of these uh, failed Kickstarters? How much or how often is it just incompetence, or ignorance, you know, something it's basically more innocent so that. versus like intentionally trying to rip people off. Yeah, oh yeah, I, I would say it's definitely more so the former where it's accidental. They didn't realize what they'd signed up for. This is a much bigger project than we anticipated. That's the normally the go-to. Um I, it's also the story I've covered the most. Like I've covered that and they ran out of money and they ran out of money. And when you get to the end point and you've, you're that person that's working on that Kickstarter and you have run out of money, you've got to make a choice. Do I run away uh, or do I own up to it? And regardless of the outcome, it's not good because they've got to that stage. Um, uh, and for me, I still see those all the time, all the time. Uh, I don't cover them because unfortunately i've covered that story now so many times if i do like a top five i might be able to put one in there but i mean how many times can i do that same video and they ran out of money you know what i mean i've got to try and find them more the 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 kick scammers as i call them with an interesting hook like the um uh the amico (laughs) (laughs) i was wondering which one caught you most by surprise or was there one that you would thought i never would have thought this would turn out this way well, I suppose I'm eco because I was I was fully in at the beginning. <laughs> I just you know I I, it, I think it's because I like to think I could spot one, but I'm pretty sure I couldn't. <laughs> I the, the reason why the, the amico would have been be... I would have been taken in by that. Well, yeah, the, the, the reason why is one 
it's not a new company, even though it's a new company that uh, attends a, a formation of people to make a new version of the Intellivision company. <clears throat> it's not an unrecognizable name. The dream team, as Tommy called them, um, of people working on it were like hardcore people from the industry, like really big names. Um, when I mean, for me, I saw Dave Perry and Tom, uh, uh Tommy Tallarico. I was like, that, that'll do me. That, that's that, that's they're the names I needed to see. Uh, but there was so many more, you know. Um, and yeah, it, it obviously, I, 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 I think it got to a stage with that project, even like you said earlier. I think the intentions were good to begin. In fact, I, I'd put money on you'd, you'd never know, but I put the money on the intentions were good from the beginning. It was just handled so horrendously, and there were too many lies um, along the way. Yeah, just looking at a comment here from a Ben One Music. He says, I never expect to see my $100 deposit again. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It happens it's all sad. the time. That's sad. I mean, to think, and for a lot of, you know, folks, this is not small amount of money you know this is you know substantial investment in something but yeah. i think your point really is is really solid just if you're not buying something right that's the that and that is it that is it people do really hyper aware of that yeah and also the product you're buying um you don't know what it's going to be like they have they have the best idea of what it's going to be like but it still might not turn out like that you know i i've backed games before uh, one I always go to uh, is a, a a a Red Riding Hood type game, a 3D game I got, like a 3D platformy sort of game, adventure game uh, that was very similar to the Ad Ad Alice Madness Returns, like art mm -hmm. style. Um, and the game came out; it was completable in about twenty minutes. It was so small; I spent like twenty quid to get this game, um, and um, it, it was very glitchy. You know, you'd fall through the wall at certain points and whatever else. Um, but I don't regret buying it in, in one bit because throughout the process of making it, you got updates from the people you, um, uh, they, they, they fully owned up that we've just run out of money. This is the best we can do. Uh, and they constantly told you what was going on during the process. Um, and even though that was a failed Kickstarter in the sense that when it came out, it was just panned by critics. It was a terrible game and you can get it cheaper now than what I paid for to back it. Um, I still see it as a positive because I got to see that behind the scenes experience mm. uh, along the way. Uh, and I feel like uh, in my eyes, that wasn't a failure because of that. Yeah, there's something to be said for that. Yeah, I, like yeah, that. Yeah. I was going to flip the script a little bit on you. Because <laughs> you know, we do have a lot of uh, game developers and people that watch you know this channel. I'm yeah. sure they're wondering, like, you know, I've talked to a few of them. And they've mentioned that they're thinking about a crowdfunding. Yeah idea so i wonder what your advice would be to somebody maybe who doesn't have the big name let's say yeah 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 should you just stay away from this or no what? no not at all i think kickstarter is good uh it's definitely on the decline sadly uh i think um i always go back to board games but basically board games were there was its dirty little secret at one point it was it was just like you know board games were uh, you you don't make money making board games but on kickstarter you do I think the first kickstarter I ever got was the uh, exploding kittens yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds about right. Um, but uh, yeah, so it is on the decline. Uh, however, there are plenty of success stories from developers uh, on the high end of the scale. Uh, e Iger, Iger from the Castlevania franchise, um, the creator of the Castlevania games, he did a Kickstarter for Bloodstained. That was, uh, you know, there were, there were a few hiccups along the way, but that was a wildly successful game when it eventually did come out. Um, uh, then, then there's plenty of others like Shovel Knight I think was one of them as well yeah Shovel Knight was a hugely popular game and that started on Kickstarter uh, a game I absolutely adore is called um, I always get the name of it wrong it's Downhill Mountains something like that it's called it's it's a BMX game I need to I've got it it's, it's three words it's Downhill uh, Mountains I think it was done by Thunder uh, Thunder Fall is it called Lonely Mountains Downhill? No, here we go. Um, it's yeah, a lo yeah, Lonely Mountains Downhill. That's it. That started as a Kickstarter. Brilliant little game that is. Really good and arcadey fun. That is awesome game, uh, and that started on Kickstarter. So there's definitely some really good ones on there. Uh, and if you're a developer that's uh, making your own game, yep, there it is. 
um, you will. Um, th th there's plenty of examples of what other people have done. Um, copy them, <laughs> basically, yeah. copy them, and know that the amount of money you're going to be earning. I mean, this is pretty obvious stuff. I'm sort of telling you how to. to, to, to what, what's the what's the phrase? Chew eggs or something? I don't know. Um, the, you you your your target is fifty thousand. You're not going to be walking away with fifty thousand. You're going to be walking away with like ten or twelve percent less of that. Then you've got to be taking away all of your uh, your rewards. Uh, what you could end up with is fifteen thousand pounds for a game that everyone's thinking you've earned fifty k for. You know, so oh, not much. Anyway, like, as an example, I'm sure. You know, it depends on how many rewards you put in there. You know, if you say, oh, we're going to send out art books, we're going to send out this, we're going to send out this, all of a sudden all your money's gone into rewards and you've got no money left for the game. I see that so often. Yeah, uh, I've talked to people that have done these, and these Kickstarters, and that's the one thing that they always say is don't do any physical rewards. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's hard because as retro collectors, we love our physical products. Yeah, yeah, especially you, right? I mean, you're very, very much about the physical media. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I've, Switch, actually, is a new console. Oh, current general console but i've got more games for that than anything now i love that system um yeah yeah yeah. Uh, but yeah go look back at ones that have done well and just copy the formula if you're trying to do a video game i i'd say it's in, impossibly hard to to do a video game without giving a demo first so many big names have tried to do one just showing concept art and it's i maybe it's worked sometimes but i don't see it Unless you are literally making a new Castlevania like Iger did. Um, I know Dizzy, like that franchise that I love, got a lot of love here in the UK, absolutely tanked on Kickstarter. Because mm. it was primarily, look here, look at this beautiful artwork. This is what the game will look like, kind of, when it comes out. But... Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Even if I didn't actually myself play the demo, even just knowing that there is a, a playable demo mm -hmm. would make me more confident. Yeah, and... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I see it. There was um, a, a Star Fox inspired Kickstarter. Uh, I'll have to look at what that was, but yeah, there was a Star Fox inspired Kickstarter, and it actually came out of the gate with the first level. So many new sites covered that, and that's what you want because, like, wow, you can actually try out this new Star Fox inspired game right now, and because of that, it done brilliantly well with its funding. If it went in there with just pictures. It might get a bit of coverage, but not to the extent that it got. So, yeah, there we go. I don't know if we could talk a little bit more about physical media. Mm -hmm. This is a big uh, passion of mine as well. Exactly. You, know, that Star you, Fox people that are, you know, they say, well, why why even bother since you can stream everything, you can emulate everything. So why are you collecting old hardware? Do you, do you play games on the uh, old hardware? Does it matter? Uh, I've even had somebody, that, I forget who it was, but they were saying there's, there's even something elitist about uh, saying you should play these games on the original hardware. And I'm like, really? <laughs> I, I'm um, I'm not with that mindset at all. Yeah. Um, I mean, I kind of just nostalgia, but, you know, is there something to be said for like the authentic? I mean, there definitely is. There definitely is. But I mean, what I don't understand is... And I'm envious of people that, that put the time in to do this. But you have like um like dedicated channels that will take an original NES or a Master System, Mega Drive, SNES, whatever. Um, and they'll get a game and they'll put it through so many different devices that cost hundreds, and then a special type of TV and all these other things to make it look as crisp crystal clean as it possibly can. And by that point, my argument is well, hang on a minute, they never looked this crystal clean back in the day. So you might as well emulate it. <laughs> you know, um, it, it, I mean, it, it's very easy for me to say that when I'm sitting That's right next to like, a pretty decent Mega Drive collection, uh, Japanese Mega Drive collection, which is the games I collect for. Um, but m most of the time, I mean, they literally do stay in their cases. And then I play, um, it's out in the game room now, I've got a Mega SG, which is an FPGA uh mega drive or genesis uh and i've got a mega s g i think i'm getting that right on top of that which is um uh, an fpga mega cd cartridge that goes on top so i can play the entire master system mega drive game gear uh mega cd and 
probably some other older Mega Drive uh, Sega things like the SG-1000 and stuff like that. Absolutely crystal clean perfectly. Um, but it's not original hardware. Like, I'm fine with it. <laughs> I'm fine with it. Yeah, I just had the ExoDOS. I don't know if you're f- familiar with that project. <clears throat> no. You're talking a little bit about some of the new uh, DOS box type. Oh, right. <laughs> accessories you can get for that and you know some of it is like this will make your monitor look more like the old crt screens and like introduce artifacts and Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's always kind of puzzled by that kind of mystified you know like what what's going on there yeah yeah. you you don't necessarily want crystal clear yeah exactly exactly it's it's i guess it's kind of there is no right answer you know do it how you want to do it they, they prefer an lp record like just because it doesn't sound as maybe as clear or whatever is the oh yeah digital version oh yeah is I mean it, like vinyl is a big thing again isn't vinyl. it hmm. I'm wondering if it's something like that trying to emulate a vinyl okay well you got time for a couple of questions sent in from uh, various entities go for it okay here's one just a couple from Matt Bradley Shergy. Uh, so let me ask, as a YouTuber based out of the UK, what are some misconceptions about retro gaming that you get from US viewers? I, what is a C64 or a Specky? Retro gaming is more than Nintendo and Sega, etc. So I guess misconceptions about retro gaming. Uh, misconceptions from America. Yes. Um, yeah, I guess maybe some of the differences between the UK well, and the yeah. It's one of the reasons I wanted to be a YouTuber. I remember I went into, and this is more misconceptions from from the UK point of things. Actually, went into a retro game shop, and you know, I'm looking through their collection, and I saw these younger lads, uh, you know, not not much younger, like five, ten years or so, talking to the guy behind the counter, talking about how popular Mega Man was, uh, and how incredible the NES was, and the video game crash of 1983. And mm. I'm just sitting there, and I'm looking. I'm like, don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> just let them carry on because <laughs> none of that was a thing here in the UK. Like, <laughs> at all. At all. I mean, NES existed. NES existed. But for us, the MOS system was the dominant um, console. And even then, at least within my circle of friends, I didn't know anyone that had a MOS system. I, I know, I tell a lie. I had a, I think I had a cousin that I didn't really ever see. I went around there once and they had a MOS system and we played Penguin Land, I think it was on it. Um, but they had a mass system for us when the, when America was having the video game crash of 1983 and I, my vision of this in 1983 is that games of disappearing in America, you know, people aren't interested in gaming anymore. Uh, over here, it just wasn't a thing. You would buy games on cassette tapes and, you know, they'd be a couple of quid. Like you would literally go to a news agents and go and buy, you know, your newspaper or your, pe- you know, penny sweets or whatever it would be. But you can also buy a video game for two pounds um, uh, because the bedroom coding scene here in the UK was hugely such a massive thing, such, mm-hmm. such a huge, huge thing. Um the good that, that's good and bad because it means it was very it wasn't easy, but it was easier for the U, for for UK bedroom coders, good UK bedroom coders, to to actually get a game out into the wild, but it's also bad because when you look through old game uh, old magazines, uh, go and have a look at like Crash and stuff like that, they would have these big sections where like these are all the games you can actually you know send a check off for and go and buy for like three pound ninety nine or whatever it would be, um, and it would be, it wouldn't be like here's the platform section, here's the arcade section, here's the uh, you know. Uh, uh, the beat em up section, it would just be the Donkey Kong section, and there would be 20 Donkey Kong clones. And here's the Pac Man wow. sections, here's 15 Pac. <laughs> so that's the bad side of it. But as a kid, I remember going, I, I, I have vivid memories of going to WH Smith, which is a news agent here in the UK, um, and picking up uh, Ghostbusters, um, which is pretty much the same version as you guys got on the NES um, for. I don't know, like two, two or three pounds. I, I mean, I probably didn't buy it. I was probably too young. My mum probably bought it for me. Um, took it home. It was all right, but it didn't matter because it was two pounds. I'll just buy another one, <laughs> another game next week. Um, and then on top of that, we were so tight as a country that when my friends bought games, I would just buy a blank cassette tape on my dual hi-fi and copy their game. And then what you would end up having are these sort of mixtapes 
of like 20 games on them you know <laughs> you know like i'm spending two quid i'll just copy your game you know so when one kid bought a game like all of his friends had that same game mm. because we would just all lend each other our games to to, to rip uh and when you knew a um uh an adult that was into you know spectrum or amstrad um then you just got an instant instant supply of games when an adult could go to a shop they would just come back with 20 games because it was just so cheap you know <laughs> So that's um, a bit of a misconception. The, 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 the video game crash really wasn't a thing here in the UK, and or well, at least the ripples weren't felt, let's put it that way. Uh, I'm sure it did halt some kind of production. At the end of the day, America is a very dominant force and very, very powerful. And, you know, things aren't working. It does have effects to other parts of the world. But for us, the home commuter market was, was huge. Um, so, yeah. And then when the NES came out, it wasn't... Um, marketed the same way it was in america um we had a lot of american influences with the stuff we watched on telly and the stuff we would you know we would absorb pop culture wise but when it come so it technically should have done well you know the popularity of mario and all that sort of stuff for the nes but it didn't have an effect over here the same way it did um for you guys so for us it was the mass system uh and obviously sega was uh, mega drive was more popular than the super nintendo but not not as dominant you know it was a bit more bit more 50 50 by that point um and yeah so that was that was a fairly big one and we, we, just, we had different interests i suppose but i, I, don't, I, read I, don't a book. I read a book i think it was something like from bedrooms to billions or something like oh, that oh yeah brilliant stuff yeah <laughs> i was just always uh i feel like i missed out sometimes because the you know i was reading some of the or some of the stuff in there they were talking about the i think it was zap magazine and you yeah zap, it. yeah yeah uh, where these uh, bedroom coders are kind of the rock stars, and it was like these these punk stars, you know, doing oh this, yeah this coding. And I'm like, I don't think they we over here it was just nerds, you know these these are nerds. I think that's all you would hear. <laughs> uh, whereas there, it seemed like it was very much a this is really cool, you know, what, what these guys are doing. Yeah, uh, check out the um, that video I talked about earlier, the Dizzy Complete History that goes into the history of these two bedroom coders, the Oliver twins. Um, that were just these two twins that just like, like put themselves in their bedroom, you know, like their parents of their parents' house and just kept pumping out games. Right. If we can make a game every two weeks, thankfully the majority, not everything, but the majority of their games were actually good. <laughs> you know, There were some stinkers in there. Um, that, I mean, there was like a, a fruit machine simulator, you know, like, so you push a button. Oh, look, it's done the thing. Let's push the button again. Oh, look, it's done the thing again. You know, there really isn't much more to it than that. Oh. Um, but the fact that you've just spent a couple of quid on that game, you're probably all right with that, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, but you kind of alluded to it earlier, too, all the, I guess, bootlegging and... I, it, I had no idea it was illegal. I thought it was completely fine to do that. I remember there was a period here, I don't know how many people remember this, but you'd go to a Blockbuster or a place that was running these videotapes uh, and there would be uh, Nintendo games there, mm -hmm. and there were Sega, mostly in Nintendo games. But I guess that just wouldn't be a thing, <laughs> you know, in a place where most people were, you know, playing uh, games on disc-based or tape-based systems. What like copied games? Yeah, I mean, why would you rent? You know, one kid might rent the game and take it home and then copy it, right? And oh, right. Yeah, no, you wouldn't. You, there wouldn't was no... a, it wouldn't be a sustainable business model. Maybe there was rental. I... I, you know what? I don't know. I don't think there was. A, I mean, I was a young kid back then. I can't think of any time that you would ever rent home computer games. I don't think that was really a thing at all. Um, yeah, I don't think that was a thing. I'm, I'm sure there were small shops somewhere that sold, you know, the higher end games that were like maybe ten pounds or something like that. I know um, when I got Turtles, the that that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or Hero Turtles as it was known here. Um, that adventure game they did, the NES one, they had that for the um, Amstrad. I know that was a bit more expensive. I think that was like maybe 10 or 12 pounds. Um, maybe that was there was a rental somewhere that did that, but no, rental didn't really become a thing. I, I definitely rented games for the Mega Drive or the, the Genesis. Like I remember renting like Home Alone and stuff like that, mm. you know, the Terminator. Yeah. <laughs> did you ever have those magazines that would have the code and you type in the, the yeah. program? Yeah, but... yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> finally uh, ran into somebody else that remembers that yeah doing doing uh doing that as a youngster that can't touch type with a big fat amstrad keyboard and i'm like 
uh, and it's like four pages long. <laughs> you ever get one to work without some kind of error? I, I I I remember getting to the end and realizing it's not working for some reason more often than it ever did. I I, I didn't do it a lot. I've got to be honest. It, what I did more was when you got the Amstrad, you got a book that came with it, and that would be that would they would have like codes in that that were a bit shorter. Some of them. And you push the thing, and it'd make like a little flashy line go across the screen in different patterns. It all looks very pretty. Some mm-hmm. I remember doing that more often than the codes that you find in the magazines. Well, you got. Do you have time for two more questions? No, go for it, man. I'm, a, I'm a, as much time as you need. Okay, I think this is a good one here. Uh, so, how do you? We're thinking about your videos again in your channel. Mm. So how do you engage with your audience and what role does do they play in shaping your content? Um, engagement is hard. People, you get feedback from people and then like, you should cover this. And... <laughs> oh, all the time. I mean, I've got a backlog of complete history that people want me to make. Um, I always talk about, uh, what is it called? Um, the Dreamcast game. I, can't, I don't know why I've got cannon fodder in my head. I saw it on the screen earlier. It's not cannon fodder. Um there's a game for the Dreamcast that people keep asking me to do, and it's one I've wanted to do, Power Stone. I have wanted to do for an incredibly long time. Unfortunately, it's one I've hit a, a brick wall with more times than I... I you know, th- th- there is no decent history on it um, to make that video. I, c- I can make a video just reviewing those two games. That, that'll be fine. But looking for actual history on the history of Power Stone, it got to the point where I reached out to the guy that made it I forget his name right now, uh, and he was just like, "I can't talk." And you need to go through the, um, uh, the 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 correct procedure of speaking to. I think it's Capcom. Um, I'm just like, "Hey, like, that, that's the end of that." You know, "Hey, Capcom, you know that franchise you don't care about anymore. Do you mind getting hold of the developer you don't work for anymore and giving them the AOK to speak to me?" Like, it's not going to happen. Um, but um, yeah, it's just you know, that, and that happens from time to time. Um, but engagement wise, so yeah, so yeah, to answer your question, I'm always getting given suggestions. Um and my answer my answer is always like either, yeah, that's really good. I'd like to get to that one day, you know, because they take so bloody long to make. Um uh worms is one I've been working on for a really long time. I'll get around to finishing it at some point. Uh, you know, stuff like that. Someone and then you get to people say, Oh, can you do Zelda? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll just quickly do Zelda, shall I? <laughs> You know, like it's huge, hugely popular. I have huge franchise or Resident Evil. Like this isn't something I can just do. This will take several months to make. Um, uh, so yeah, <laughs> like, and then you get people from the opposite end of the scale that will say, "Can you do a video on uh, Horace or something absurdly weird from the, the the home computer era that no one's heard of except for a very niche group of people?" Um, so. Yeah, it, it, it's hard. It's hard. I, I I always take the advice on. And, you know, sometimes I do. I'm like, you know, what? actually, I am going to do that. And I think Cannon Fodder was one that was suggested. And I was like, yes, I'm going to do that. And I did it. Um, So, you know, I do do it that. Uh, and when it comes down to engagement, I really struggle uh, with engagement. Um, because as a YouTuber, you've obviously got to promote yourself onto several different platforms. Um, and you, but you, it's really hard to engage and, and and be constantly engaging on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, threads, your Discord channel, your your, your YouTube comments, trying to answer, talk to everybody in all of those things. It's just super hard. I, I try and set myself time aside to do that, um, um, but more often than not, I I, I end up editing more. <laughs> you know, like that, and it, it pushes into that time. Uh, that, that I, I don't have an answer. I haven't cracked engagement. I've got to be honest. It's it's an incredibly hard thing to do. So yeah, yeah. I like the cannon fodder. I had John Hare on my channel one time, and he actually oh, played. Oh, he cool. played the song on his guitar from the really. The that's insane. Cool. <laughs> like, man, that's a cool dude. He is he is definitely. That's okay. Really cool. Uh, the last thing I think we could discuss, and you'd mentioned this in your email, is a a little thing called <laughs> mini. Yeah, yeah. So what's going on with this? What is all this about? Right, guys getting beat up. <laughs> yeah, one in the background there sh- shaking his hands. That's me. Yeah. Uh, right. 
as a teenager, um, me and my mates, before the days of YouTube, me and my mates used to get just drunk, act like idiots. Uh, this is me getting like beaten up here, basically. <laughs> I have not seen this in a long time. Uh, right, so yeah, basically we would get drunk and just be idiots and all that sort of stuff. And we had a website where we would upload the clips. of It was really tame stuff. And it was before Jackass as well. Uh, and then obviously Jackass came out and it was um, it propelled us to be a bit more like that, uh, as did Dirty Sanchez and stuff like that. Um, and, we, you know, we, we got really, really into it. And we were like, we had like T-shirts and stickers and all this sort of stuff that we would give people when we went clubbing and all this other stuff. And we'd send people like promo CDs of our stuff, all this sort of stuff. And then um, um, one day we got an, a, a, an email or the guy that ran the website, our friend. It was all, it were all, we're all just friends. It wasn't like random people. We were all like just mates that hung out. Uh, got an email from uh, Channel, well, a, a company working for Channel 5 and said, do you want to turn it into a TV show? And we're like, hell yeah, that'd be awesome. And then about a year and a half later, um, uh, it actually ended up going ahead because it has to go through all these different hoops for that to happen. Um, and uh, yeah, so we ended up having a TV show. It wasn't the same sort of stuff that we would have done. Like we would have been a lot more like just idiots getting drunk, doing stupid things, um, having a laugh with your mates, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, <laughs> I'm just remembering some of it now, and uh, yeah, that was it really. So it, it was a lot more family friendly. The, the the pitch they came up with that we ended up going down. So like some scientists would say, you know, can can you cure a phobia by forcing that person to do that thing? So one of the guys was scared of needles, so they gave him acupuncture, or they were going to give him acupuncture. Um, another guy. Uh, me, uh, my 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 fear was flying heights, so they strapped me to the top of a, a biplane, uh, the wings of a biplane, oh my God. Into, the, <laughs> into the air. Uh, one of the guys was scared of dogs, so they put him in this massive suit. Uh, it had like that big thing on, you know, if a dog bites it, it doesn't hurt you, you know, like the the, the big things on his arms. But they just covered him in bacon, um, and then they blew the whistle, and he ran. Uh, a, a, a dog track and then they blew another whistle and then they let the dogs out <laughs> but they weren't like running dogs they were like attack dogs um, but what was hilarious because when he heard that second whistle he started running faster and bacon's flying off him <laughs> in all these different ways so the dogs were taking longer to get to him <laughs> because they get stopping to eat the bacon on the way or the little bits of bacon uh, so there's little things like that um, and it was a lot more science based like they talked about what what can I what was one of the more interesting things the stuff you were seeing on the screen there a moment ago that was to replicate what happens to you in a car crash um so they were saying like how do you get whiplash basically so you would have this scientist guy uh, professor Stuart Milligan um his name was and he was actually a scientist in some uh, professor scientist guy in some London university somewhere um and he would give the science behind how what happens when you get whiplash and then they would take me and the guys to the upcoming rugby team to basically just stand there and just get and get the crap beaten out of us, basically. Um, I was a cheerleader that day, thankfully, like in the background for comedy value. Um, and uh, I, I wasn't one of the ones getting hit. But the two guys, Nick and Ollie, these are all like still my friends, these guys, um, that did get attacked. One of them broke a collarbone. And the other one broke a rib, um, maybe an ankle as well. But that was like the only injuries we had on the show. Um, Can't imagine what the insurance must have been like for that. Yeah, show. it was pretty hardcore. I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Um, yeah, Did we got know? paid for it. It was just like it was. It was still an excuse for like all four of us to just mess around. So that we we had little things that we would do throughout the month. There was things like, do you have slush puppy in America? Do you know what slush puppy is? Like the like these drinks that, that were full of ice. And... Oh yeah, like the ices, but like fruity flavors and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like a lot more liquidy, yeah. you know, with lots of ice in there. Oh, okay. Um, there's a Guinness World Record for downing a pint of that, and obviously it gives you brain freeze. So we had a slush puppy machine in our apartment that they uh, in, our, in our house that they put us in 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 Newquay in London, and um, every day we'd have to try and see if we can see how quickly we can down a pint of. Um, uh, a slush puppy and then we'd just be in agony on the floor like so cold and headaches and stuff like that but by the end it got easier because we put vodka and stuff into the actual things so i was like having vodka and, and jack daniels 
they, it was just us fucking about for a month and it was just so much fun um before i had kids i suppose it was the best month of my life i suppose it was good fun you know <laughs> just hanging out with my friends for a month you know just just the lads drinking having fun being idiots doing stupid stuff like i could go on there was so much we did there um what what was some of the other stuff we did uh i've had liposuction for the for science just to see what that was like that was ridiculous um i i i I can't remember what else there was. What else was there? What else was there? Oh, here's a stupid one. We there there was another Guinness Book of World Records for eating tripe. Do you know what tripe is? Like sheep guts? Yeah, it's it's the the inside layer of a stomach. Um and it's disgusting. It's disgusting. And they boiled it and it was this this they, 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 for for the show, they they laid it all out. They had these these big silver trays in front of us. There was five of us. Uh, five of us, six of us, whatever. Um, and they'd put a big mound of this tripe, boiled cold tripe on each one. Um, and it was at a farm uh, in London, in a London farm. And then they put cow dung around the edge to make it look like, not on the plate, but like near it, uh, just to, just for the effect of the camera. There was cows walking around behind us. We was in the middle of a field. And up, our food wasn't anywhere near it, but you could still get the smell <laughs> <laughs> of it and it was basically how much can you eat uh and i'm like the disgusting one of the group there was a guy there that was a bit more extreme another guy that was a bit more like clumsy or whatever and i was the one that could just do this sort of stuff i could chug this stuff back so i'm just going and i'm eating this stuff as quick as i can trying to eat i can't remember what it was but it was a lot a lot and i ate all of this tripe um and i'm like throwing up and i'm trying to drink it hold it back hold it back and um i end up eating it all and they're like, yes, you've you've done it. You've beaten a world record. Oh, there we go. That was the tripe. This is it. Oh. Uh, yeah, you see, look, you see all that horrible stuff on the table. Oh. That was it. That's me on the end with my massive hair. Um, so I ate it all. And I don't know how PG this podcast is, so I won't say exactly what my mates were saying to me to make make it worse for me. They went, it it's got the texture of you know um white stuff um to really put me off <laughs> but eventually I, I ate it and i i'd beaten the world record uh and they said right we need to go record some b b-roll footage now and i went into the field and you'll probably see some of that b-roll footage in a minute of me just dancing around the, the cows for no reason oh. just to catch the b footage and by the time i got back the cleaner had cleaned up what was left on the uh plate so they forgot to weigh how much was there before or after and I, I missed my opportunity of being in the Guinness Book of World Records because of that. Oh, that's thanks. Yep. So Man, I was not having a good day that just, day. I mean, there are people that actually enjoy this, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> wow. Yeah, there's me. Look, I'm in the um in the field now doing my B-roll, but by the time I get back, they uh they'd already cleared up the uh the tripe. <laughs> there you go look threw it all in there Ugh. and they weighed it before and then what was ever what was left showed how much i'd eaten it was ridiculous I uh, and i mean we did a thousand other things as well it, it, it was it was such an awesome month of just hanging out with my mates but yeah anyway long story short uh definitely not short actually long story slightly less long um <laughs> They, uh, it, it, it just wasn't popular enough. They put us on at the same time as Coronation Street here in the UK on Channel oh. 5. And Coronation Street is like a third of the TV market at the time. I'm sure it's not the same anymore. Uh, watched Coronation Street. And because it was a bit more family friendly, they were definitely aiming for a family friendly crowd as opposed to like, you know, lads watching or whatever. Um, so therefore, yeah, we, 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 we lost a heavy chunk. It was, it was a big fight between that slot or the slot that was half an hour later. And um, uh, that went to another show called The Gadget Show. Um, uh, so if it was flipped around, maybe I wouldn't be a YouTuber and I'd be doing that full time. <laughs> I'd be, I'd be like a big of a <laughs> When you're like a celebrity walking around, everybody's like, oh, yeah. I mean, we got for, for a not long. You're, more, you're probably more famous for DJ or for your YouTube channel. than. than... Uh, yeah, more people watch my YouTube than they did on that show, definitely. I, I remember the numbers came in. Like The numbers came in pretty good but the numbers they wanted 
we got by the final episode, which I think was like seven or eight episodes in. Um, I've got the original master master ones here. It, yeah, eight episodes in. Um, they got to the numbers they needed to by the last episode, but they needed that from the beginning. Um, it just yeah, that's what it is. When I mean, we didn't have any control over the production, we just said, "Hey, turn up here." Every day they woke us up and got us to do stupid stuff, and that was just it. Uh, normally with a hangover. <laughs> you know? um, yeah, it was just good fun. But yeah, um, apparently we were quite popular in Italy uh, for some reason. It, hmm. Italians really liked us. Uh, so the, the, the problem is in showbiz, they always say like, you know, like no business like show business or whatever you want to call it. But like we did, so we did the show and I remember during the making of it and, and during the promotion of it uh, all the way up until that first episode went live, um, uh, we would have like designated people at the company that would actually like be our um, runners, I suppose. Uh, and every time you ring up and if they weren't there, the, even the answer machine, were like, this is insert name here from the human guinea pigs, blah, blah, blah. And they would like, and I'm like, this is so cool. We've got like assistants and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but as soon as that, and, and they would constantly ring us and go, okay, this is what's going on here. We're going to be doing this promotion on that day. Come up to London on this day and we'll do some promo shots, blah, blah, blah. And they were so in on it. But then as soon as that sh that first episode went live, um, they, uh, it, it, and it didn't do the numbers they wanted. All those answer machines got changed. The numbers got changed. They just didn't care about <laughs> you anymore. Um, and what was weird, <laughs> those started getting simulate, uh, uh, syndicated Sorry, around the world. So early days of Facebook for us, or even MySpace, I think it was, we would get, as a group, we would start getting added. People would start adding us, but from like Spain or from Australia, or I'm like, I guess the show's playing in Spain at the moment. You know what I mean? Or I guess the show's here. But Italy was the one that apparently we were most well known in Italy. I don't know why. Uh, someone once, said, and I, I wish I still kept it. Someone once sent one of my friends a clip of us uh, being dubbed in Italy, uh, which is weird. Just having someone that's done your voice in another language is weird. Italy is an interesting country. Maybe we got some Italian uh, viewers that can clue us in. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I don't know. Every so often, someone says, I remember that. There's a lot more history to it as well. Like it was originally going to be a Discovery Channel show. Um, yeah, I was thinking it was kind. Of, it's kind of in there with MythBusters and shows like that, right? Well, yeah, that was it. Yeah, we was going to be originally on Discovery Channel, um, and I don't know what happened behind the scenes, but one day they just came in and said, "So, Channel Five, which is a much smaller channel here in the UK, like significantly, and it's uh, out of the main te terrestrial TV channels. Um, it was definitely on the lower end. You know, you got BBC One, BBC Two, CITV, oh, CITV, uh, ITV, uh, Channel Four, and Channel Five, and they were like your main terrestrial TVs. You know, if you don't have Sky or cable or Freeview, whatever, they're the channels you had. Um, but Channel Five was definitely the lowest of all four, all five of those. Um, so for us, it was a bit like, okay, that sucks that we're going to Channel Five because we wanted to instantly have a worldwide audience with the Discovery Channel, mm. and um, they, uh, they, they, I. I they 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 sold it to us that Channel Five were going to pay more, but I don't know how true that is. I don't know if they were just saying that to keep us happy. I don't know. Um, either way, Discovery Channel ended up release making a show called The Human Guinea Pig, uh, <laughs> and that's like one guy that did a lot of the stuff we did, and that ran for two seasons. So I don't know. You ever get contacted about your your gaming? content trying to bring that to tv uh yeah a couple of times um uh i had a there was there was a it was, it was more of an internet service that was on like a free view thing there was someone there that was going to do something and, and release several ones but i don't think much ever came from that honestly um i've just i, I re recently released um a blu-ray uh which is quite cool wow. collection of uh 10 complete histories which are all the sega ones and i've just finished i literally yesterday just finished my second blu-ray which is going to be based on the uh history in the game series so i'll be having stuff on there like evil dead um uh evil dead the mask uh beavis and butthead friday the 13th saw all that sort of stuff looking at the history and the creation of those franchises 
and all of the games related um, to That's, them. Where do you get those? Uh, yeah, if you go to, um, I'll, I'll send you a link. It's a uh, vinegar syndrome. Um, uh, the second one isn't out yet. The second one's in production now as we speak. Uh, here we go. Copy. And let me uh, send that to you. I think I can do a chat on Zoom, can't I? Yeah. Welcome to Q&A. Can I do it in the Q&A room? Is that right? There should be a chat tab right next to Q&A. Oh, yes. yes. I'm blind. There you go. Sent you a link. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, release the Blu-ray, which is nice. A lot of love and attention went into that. Love, care, and attention. Oh, here we go. Mm. Vinegar Syndrome. Vinegar Syndrome. <laughs> yeah, they're a uh, like a, a boutique sort of uh, Blu-ray label from the States. Well, that's not a bad price. Oh, we got some additions here. Oh, limited. Yeah, the limited ones have sold out. That's the uh, these ones with the slip cover. Oh, neat. And then on the inside, you've got the one oh, that's sold out there. already. Well, I'll tell you the cool thing about this <clears throat> is um, firstly, there's commentaries for everyone, uh, there's dual commentaries for everyone on this one. So you've got people like Ashins, uh, uh, Kim Justice, Nostalgia Nerd. Quite a few other people as well. Uh, one a different person for every single one. Um, looking into the history of different Sega franchises, so you've got like Outrun, Afterburner, uh, Congo Bongo, Seaman, uh, obviously Streets of Rage, House of the Dead, Super Hang On, stuff like that. Uh, uh, what Daytona USA, uh, all those sort of things. Uh, where ones we got on there? Mister Thunderwing, who knows everything there is to know about Outrun and stuff like that. He's on there. Kim Justice is another voice on there as well. Loads of special features. Uh, you've got some. Uh, 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 hidden Easter eggs. I wanted to add some Easter eggs in there because it's gaming related, you know. You can change the way the menus look and, and do different audio for certain videos and unlock like hidden videos and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah. And I've just said, I should have done my second one as well. Seaman. Seaman, yes. <laughs> the Dreamcast game. Oh, Outrun's a good one. Yeah. Seaman's crazy. Um, that's the one of the only complete histories I've actually done in a collaboration. Um, because I knew of Seaman. There's a, the, the Dreamcast game Seaman. Um, but what I didn't know too much about were all of the sequels, because they're Japanese exclusive. And I, as, as it's a game that you need to talk in a mic, I can't play Oh, them. that's that one. Yeah. It seemed kind of familiar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I actually reached out to a guy called Jimmy Happo, who's one of the best channels on on YouTube for retro gaming stuff that you've not heard of. It's a really cool channel. Uh, and he um, basically just took over all of the Japanese games section of the Blu-ray. Yeah, this was just crazy. Yeah, this. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> uh, wow. There he is, old Yute Sato. He's the uh, creator of Seaman. Uh, uh, such an obscure game, but that, that, that's why I love the Dreamcast so that's much. Tricky. Such an obscure system. Yeah, I got I got a good Dreamcast. And yeah, there is a Seaman Two. There's a Christmas edition Seaman. There were Seaman games that were going to be coming out for different systems. There's all toys and stuff you can get of Seaman out in Japan. Is uh, there was like desktop weird things you can do and make the little characters swim across your desktop and. You can send weird emails to do with Seaman with certain programs. There was so much to do with that. But all of those sequels were all Japanese exclusive. I just, even if I downloaded them or imported them or whatever, I just wouldn't be able to do that sort of stuff. It's really obscure stuff. So I had to get someone from Japan to, to cover in those sections. In fact, here we go. Here's the Japanese copy of Seaman for the PlayStation 2. Uh, and what's really cool about this, I'll show this in the video. Box. Yeah, it's a beautiful box, but look at the the special controller that it comes with. I mean, obviously, you've got the game there. All looks pretty normal. But the controller ah, is that. <laughs> How uncomfortable does that look to play? <laughs> so it's got a microphone on it, um, obviously, because you need to talk to uh, uh, the, the, the fish. It looks like some kind of Egyptian artifact or something. Yeah, yeah. It's, it kind of works with the theme of the game, honestly. Oh. 
but it's such an obscure, weird little device. I was like, you know what? I've got a... It's all the stuff related to sea, man. Wow. There, there's so much. I was like, you know what? I've got to, I've got to, uh, got to do that. And and actually, I ended up writing a um an article about it as well for Did You Know Gaming um for their um region locks books as well, dropping it all over the place. But yeah. Maybe there there'll be, maybe there'll be a Kickstarter for. <laughs> I mean, that would be awesome. He reached out to me to to for an interview after I did the video, and um, we 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 oh. lost communication. It never ended up happening. I'm really gutted. I missed out on that, honestly. But it's it's nice to know that the developers watch your stuff. You know. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. I'd I'd love to reach out and speak to him, but it was for a third party, and then me and the third party lost contact, and now I've got no way of contacting him. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I guess I say it's awesome, but you've had some bad experiences with that too, right? Oh, well, yeah, what with uh, Ren Stimpy, <laughs> <laughs> John K. Yeah, I, I've actually got it here. I've shown someone. So here it is. There's my John K. <laughs> artwork. Um, oh man, it's weird, weird owning this because one part of me is like. The ten-year-old in me is screaming for joy that I have original Ren and Stimpy artwork in my hand, but the adult <laughs> is also screaming for an opposite re for the other reason, because John K is a bit of a paedophile. Uh, and what makes it worse is someone reached out to me and said um, the girl in the, in the picture um, they believe is the girl that he groomed. Wow. I mean, I don't know how true that is. Weird, eh? Yeah, that video. I mean, I had I've watched Rena Stimpy as a kid. I think I still got some of the comics, you know. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. I didn't know any of that stuff. It what I've learned since doing all this stuff and meeting these people and then not being the awesome people you expect them to be as a kid is uh, separate the art from the artist <laughs> you know like and with with something like Ren and Stimpy even though it's obviously John Kay's baby he's the guy that you know fought it up and everything else um there were so many other thumbs in those pies you know like other people worked on this um uh really talented artists not I mean, John Kay you know for all of his negativity is actually a very good artist but out you know th th there are some other incredible people that worked on it too so yeah, I think about that a lot with games too. Think, I mean, there might be hundreds of people that worked on this game, so do we yeah. want to trash it just because you know the? <laughs> yeah, because the CEO who didn't work on it said something. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we exactly. didn't even get into Unity, I and mean, I guess we can save that for. What's that? Say that again. We could have. <clears throat> you know, I was just thinking about Unity. Uh, you and had. Yeah. I've been working with that platform or that uh, tool, I guess. Uh, about the time that you covered in that video. Oh, yeah, the rise and fall. The yeah. CEO was like saying all this crazy stuff. And, you know, there were people that were uh, leaving the Unity over that, you know, switching to different engines and things. But again, I, was, I, had, I had the same thought, you know, well, that's just one person. I guess it's a very important person there. But yeah. What about all those other people? You just want them to, you know, well, exactly exactly there's uh there's more there's more to it than that and um but i mean at the same time if it's not going to work for you i can understand why people left you know what i mean like oh. if, if, the, if the if the business plan that's been put in place doesn't work for you then um you know it's not the not the person that's choosing not to use it anymore's fault it's the management who have made the stupid decisions um that ultimately to blame you know so yeah well, DJ Slope, thanks for taking this time, folks. Go check out the YouTube channel. I think you'll have lots and lots of stuff to watch. I mean, I don't know how many hundreds of hours. <laughs> Do you there's, have a hour? there. there's a lot there's on there. There's a lot on there. Yeah, there's a lot. You got me very happy, though, I think, with with, uh, with that channel. And then you got your Patreon. Uh, so support this Patreon page. I'll put all these links on the uh, show notes, of course. And then I'm trying to find that... Uh, that DVD link or Blu-ray link. I'll put that on there too. So we'll have Oh, thank you very much. Linty of merchandise. 
it's it's not a um uh, a big you know a big earner for me or anything like that the uh the blu-ray it's just it's just a really cool thing to be a part of you know uh that, that and that's really it like it it's definitely more and I, I know it sounds corny as hell but it's definitely more for people that are fans of the show because like it, it, oh, i know I, I i i i personally own blu-rays and, like I, said, I would buy the cap you know as soon as that cap goes on so <laughs> uh, it might already be there actually if you go for pixel empire we're just start, starting to work on a, sh on a on a store um uh for that in fact and yeah oh no it's there yeah my, my they've actually opened the store and my hat is there look at that awesome um generally yeah, well it's not on my head though because i got a big big pumpkin head yeah so do i so do i <laughs> Well, it's cool. It's edgy. It slopes. You think it would confuse people if I wore this cap? What are you going to think? Yeah, that slopes they, game room's got long hair. Were they think that, what? Wait, wait. What channel am I on? <laughs> what is? You got sheets? No, this must not. This no, must no, that's that's promoting other parts of the shop. I've just got a few few t-shirts. This is the first <laughs> time I'm seeing this. If I, I've got to be honest, I've got my main t-shirt. The oh, this is awesome. Yeah, yeah, I designed that. Oh, slopes. Oh, that's I'm having good. a chat with them next week and we're actually going to properly start promoting it because oh, at the maybe. moment I, I haven't promoted this at all. I love t shirts, kick scammers. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> there it is. Slopes. Wow, nice. I need to, that, I, need yeah. to uh, I need to change my YouTube banner now with this because uh, you, you have the, the thing underneath your channel that, that promotes this stuff. I didn't realize that this was finally up. <laughs> it's a good thing I've had this call. <laughs> there yeah. we go. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, thanks again. No worries, buddy. <laughs> it's been great. Hope we'll, hope we'll uh, have you back on. Yeah, I'm. I'm well up for it. I, I'm always. I'm always up for this sort of stuff. I really appreciate it, buddy. That'd be awesome. Thank you so much. I. I really appreciate you reaching out. Like honestly, this. It, it, it's always one of those things that when you meet people that that know your stuff or you you, you get reached out by people like yourself that want to get on a podcast it, i i promise you uh, i don't know i'm not speaking for everyone but definitely for me this is way more exciting for me than it you know it is for people to ask me to be on their podcast like, i think it's freaking awesome that people reach out i think mean, that's so cool i really appreciate it well thank you mm. <laughs> pleasure's all mine that's all good man quality well, stuff And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. <laughs> Man, it was such a treat getting to a chat with Slope. You know, I was thinking, you know, I've had a lot of guests on this this channel over the years, as you can imagine. There's a lot of very brilliant, high IQ, genius level intellects on here. Some, you know, very talented, extreme talent, you know, all that. But, you know, I don't always think to myself, I have a lot of admiration and respect for what they do, of course, but... You know, I'm not always thinking that these would be people I'd want to hang out with you know, on the weekend just for fun. <laughs> uh, but I gotta say, Slope looks like he'd be a blast, doesn't he? <laughs> so, you know, if I'm ever in uh, his neck of the woods, I hope uh, I can drop in on him because I think that would be hilarious. <laughs> wow, tripe. Uh, okay, uh, first off, I want to thank all of you. Yes, you included. Yes, I, I see you, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> Ken James in Alberta, welcome to the pack. New Ratrons. You know, and you have to forgive me, I'm a little bit behind getting the uh, the updates on the credits uh, to uh, Matt Bradley Shergy, but you're not forgotten. It just sometimes takes a while to catch up you know, with those credits. But uh, I will never hesitate to in instantly and immediately thank you. Uh, thank you from the bottom of my uh, rat infested heart uh, for supporting this show, for keeping it on the air. You know, we're just kind of scraping by. It's been kind of pathetic, really. You know, we, we need uh, and to keep these, these the funding going. We need more supporters like uh, Ken James and Alberto to step up to the plate and start uh, funding the show. You know, we're almost uh, where we need to be, but uh, we could really use your help. So uh, if I hate to do this, you know, obviously, but, um, you know, if you're comfortable upgrading your account a little bit, it sure be a great time. Uh, to do that. I really appreciate it. It only takes a couple of minutes. Just pop over to that Patreon link, and or like I like to call it, the Ratreon, 
A uh, link in the show notes takes a couple of seconds. It's easy. You set it up, you forget about it. <laughs> You're supporting the show. <laughs> totally painless, but uh, you'll be keeping the, uh, the show in production. So thank you to everyone uh, very sincerely for supporting Mad Chat. It really means a lot to me. So thank you. Thank you. And one additional thank you. Yes. Always checking to see if the bald spot has formed. <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> oh my God, did I just jinx myself? Uh, all right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? Uh, oh, got some great news here from Punny. Yes, Punny, I can always be counted on to deliver the goods. Uh, Punny's writing in about a stealth horror immersive sim by the name of Gloomwood. We have development has continued to pace on this project. Uh, but the most exciting thing is advances in rat-based gaming technology. Yes, rat-based gaming technology. <laughs> Music to my ears. <laughs> rat-based gaming technology. You know, that should be the name of a company. You know, just specializes, specializing just in that. Nothing else. Just that. Uh, but anyway, these are a couple of videos showing uh, what these developers have been doing. One, Dylan Rogers, over the past few weeks, shows off some cheese-seeking AI behavior. And I know there'll be somebody out there that says, oh, rats don't like cheese. Uh, rats are, <laughs> will only eat cheese if they're starving or something uh, like that. Well, you're, you could be right, but on the other hand, rat-based gaming behavior. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of fun. You know, they're using a rat holes and they seem to have the pathfinding. It worked out pretty well. So, yeah, it looks like a pretty fun, fun game. So, Gloomwood. Uh, next up, Miko. I wrote in about this. Co-ridden, or maybe co-ridden. <laughs> that doesn't sound very good. Probably co-ridden. Uh, maybe there we go. That sounds a little, little more appropriate. Uh, the Monster Shapeshifter Action RPG with co-op. Transform into the creatures you defeat. Well, there you go. <laughs> uh, venture out solo or in co-op in the action-packed hack and slash game for PC. Uh, so this is on Kickstarter right now. It's a, a couple uh, out of Sweden. I think, yes, yeah, Sweden. I, I had the name of the uh, the town, but, or the city, but I've left it off here. But anyway, <laughs> Swedish studio <laughs> uh, by the name of Afnerild. That sounds like a proper Viking studio, does it not? So let's see, they're trying to reach 21.5 thousand dollars i believe and it might be some other currency forgive me <laughs> but anyway uh, they got a ways to go on this and there's 25 days left in their campaign so uh, they say this is a similar vibe to diablo baldur's gate dark alliance champions of norath uh, but also those engrossed us with uh emerging engaging narratives and side questing such as baldur's gate 2 Shadows of Um. So it looked really good to me. I went ahead and pledged to this. <laughs> you know, it definitely looked good enough to where I want to see uh, what they can do with this. So uh, I put my money where my mouth is on that one. Hopefully, this is <laughs> hopefully this Kickstarter isn't going to end up on a DJ Slope episode uh, one day. Uh, let's hope. Uh, but anyway, it looked really good. Uh, so thank you, Tomiko. And then lastly, Lobsterminator. Yes, Lobsterminator. What's Lobsterminator been doing besides lobstering? Well, he wants us to check out the gritty fantasy world of Dungeonborn and watch as terrifying enemies meet their demise thanks to various weapons like dual daggers, magic swords, and more. You know, the word various, <laughs> probably not a word to use in any kind of marketing and just a little rhetorical tip there. I'm the great Matt Barton, expert marketer. Not. <laughs> but I know not to use various. Uh, anyway, uh, let's see. Dungeonborn is a PV, PVE extraction. Okay, probably another thing not to use in your marketing. Uh, what the hell is PV, PVE? Player versus player versus environment, maybe? I'm just guessing. Uh, some combination thereof. An extraction dungeon crawler game that combines elements of tactical extraction shooters, and dungeon crawling set in a dark fantasy world. Range of classes and races. At its core, Dungeonborn is an extraction experience dungeon crawler in which players band together in small groups or play solo to seek treasure on the backdrop of a gritty gothic setting. <laughs> an open alpha on PC will be available to play during Steam Next Fest, February 2nd to February 12th. So I guess that's going on now. 
Now, I will say one thing I liked about this. The dungeons look awesome. You know, I often think uh, sometimes the dungeons in these games, uh, CRPGs, tend to look a little brighter, more cheerful, a little, a little cleaner. <laughs> they should. I mean, Dungeon Master, you're, you're, you're finding pieces of meat on the floor of the dungeon and picking it up and eating it. <laughs> no. You know, these dungeons uh, should be scary places where you, you probably wouldn't want to eat something that was lying on the floor in a proper dungeon. Yeah, just saying. Uh, well, what about that ale of the week? Oh, oh, oh what do we have? <laughs> well, uh, we have a Brooklyn Brewery non-alcoholic special effects hoppy amber. Yeah, I don't know if I'll... It's kind of hard with this glare to show you the can, but it is kind of a psychedelic action going on in this can. A little pretty can. <laughs> you know, I always like this kind of halfway between blue and purple. You know, I'm not an artist. There's probably a name for a color that's halfway between blue and purple. I just don't know. Is it violet? I don't know. It doesn't really look violet. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's see what we got here. Special effects. Smooth, delicious brew. It just so happens to be non-alcoholic. Now, see, that's what I like. <laughs> you know, I, I don't want a non-alcoholic and just say, well, uh, I, I get it. I get that it's not as good as a regular beer, but it's not alcoholic, so... You know, there's that. No, no, no. I, I just want something I would choose regardless. You know, that, that's what I'm looking for in these non-alcoholics. You know, something that tastes just as good, uh, where it'd be just fine. You know, no uh, compromise in flavor. You know, I feel like I got pretty close last time. Uh, so we'll see about this one. Let's see. Flavorful, zesty. Oh, there's a bunch of text here. Uh, it says, uh, flavorful, zesty, and satisfying. Well, okay. Well, I <laughs> can't, can't argue with that. It's right here on the can. Uh, we make flavorful brews, of course, these. Uh, now, Brooklyn Brewery, where might that be located? <laughs> uh, apparently, Brooklyn. Yes. All right, anything else here? Uh, yeah, they always uh, have to say it's got a little bit of alcohol. You know, it's like a decaf coffee might have a trace, <laughs> I suppose. Uh, but not enough to have any effect on you, which is the, uh, the goal of these. All right, anyway, let's get this puppy open and see what it's all about. And I think I'll pour some in the old centipede uh, can. And then we'll switch over to the uh, drinking horn, of course. But the problem with the drinking horn, you can't see what you're drinking. Oh, shoot. <laughs> this is indeed lots of carbonation on that. It's good to see. Good color. A little light, light color. Great head on this and lots of bubblies, little bitty bubbles. I always like that. You know, real nice head on this. You, know, you don't realize how important that is until you've had beers that don't have it. <laughs> it tastes kind of flat and, and dead. There's, there's really something to be said for the uh, the action of the, uh, uh, the uh, carbonation. All right, let's pour some into the drinking horn. No, I didn't shake that can up or anything. It's just that active. There we go. All right. Special effects hoppy amber. So I'm hoping for a lot of hops. I smell a lot of hops. <laughs> Did I say what kind of hops? And a hoppy amber. What kind of hops is it? You know, I think they should tell you. I don't see it. I could probably look it up online. You know, if you're going to list ingredients anyway, you might as well say what kind of hops are in it. And well, they're probably saying, well, Matt, if you were really a, uh, an ale connoisseur, you'd be able to smell what kind of hops are there. <laughs> uh, so yeah, maybe citra. Okay, I'll just guess. It's a fairly common one. Anyway, it does it smells very good. A slight sort of lemony, a little bit of pine uh, aroma on this. Uh, you definitely smell the hops. Let's give it a taste, though. Okay. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> uh, lots of flavor on this. Uh, again, you definitely taste the hops. Uh, no bitterness with this. Uh, more of a sweet uh, flavor, kind of a vaguely, uh, maybe a little bit of a nutty flavor. Let me give it another taste here. It is a little bit 
uh, I would say a little bit lighter in terms of density. You know, that, that seems to be a pattern with all the non-alcoholic ones I've tried so far. They don't really have a thick body on them. You know, it's very light. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to say watery, because <laughs> that would be the, uh, the kiss of death for a, for a beer. Uh, but, uh, it, you know, some, it, it probably could be a little bit thicker, I think. Uh, let's switch over to the, uh, the glass, because sometimes uh, that makes a difference. Now, I do like the flavors, though. You definitely get the hops. I could probably go with a little bit more uh, bitterness on this. It's a little bit more of an IPA flavor. You know, it's not bad. <laughs> uh, you know, frankly, I could probably tell, you know, if you gave me whatever their, one of their regular uh, amber ales and set it next to this one, I'd probably be able to tell you which one was the N.A. Uh, just because it does seem very light, a little, uh, a little bit less flavor uh, than you might expect. But, uh, on the other hand, <laughs> it's not bad. And if you wanted to go somewhere and drink some beers and you know, not feel so conscious or about not having a, <laughs> you know, a beer in your hand, and you know, one of those kinds of uh, uh, parties, I think you'd be well served with this. Uh, it's not, again, I can't say it's wonderful or my favorite beer or anything like that. But all I can say is it's not bad. Now, I'll give it one more swig here. Yeah, it's, it's really a... I guess you want to be positive about it. <laughs> you, could, you could say it's hydrating, uh, that it's refreshing. Uh, but uh, you know, probably I kind of lean more towards the, what was it, Klost Haler <laughs> that I had last time. You know, I think that's kind of a little closer to the mark, uh, at least for me, in terms of what I would put at the top of my uh, NA list. Uh, on the other hand, uh, definitely, you know, I wouldn't uh, turn my nose up at this if it was offered to me somewhere. Uh, so again, with the NA, I'm still kind of experimenting with non-alcoholics. I haven't sampled enough to really have a thorough sense of what's, uh, which ones are the best. But uh, I think this one's all right. I'd probably go, you know, just to, just in terms of uh, non-alcoholics, I might go, say, three out of five on this. If we're going to open it up to all ale, I'd probably go probably two out of five. <laughs> Somewhere lower on the scale, uh, just because I like a little more, a little more body, a little more punch. Uh, in my ales, and I realize it could be some some difficulties in the uh, NA bracket for that. Uh, but on the other hand, if you just want something to kind of sip on as you're gaming or developing or you know, whatever the case may be, and you don't have to don't want to have to worry about having too many. <laughs> well, uh, Brooklyn Brewery special effects, hoppy amber. Okay, now let's wrap it up with a quotation. And I got a quote here. Well, I'm not going to tell you who it is. I'm just going to read the quote and see if you can guess. I'll tell you at the end. I think you could probably guess. <laughs> it is a well-known fact that those people who must want... Wait, they messed this up a little bit. Let me uh, <laughs> try it again. It is a well-known fact that those people who most want to rule people are ipso facto those least seated loosed. <laughs> Wait a minute. This is not an alcoholic, right? <laughs> Okay, third attempt. <clears throat> Actually, the quotation's got some errors in it. It's the reason I'm tripping here. It is a well-known fact that those people who most want to rule people are ipso facto those least suited to do it. Anyone who is capable of getting themselves made president should on no account be allowed to do the job. <laughs> little quotation there by Doug Adams. And we hope you guys enjoyed that, and I'll see you next time. Are so ungrateful to be alive, but not you.